But Paul makes it so very clear that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And the Holy Spirit will not snuff that, let that wick get snuffed out. That fire will again bloom. You are a new creation. Well, I'd like to open here with a passage before we go to our sermon text, which is the gospel. And the text is from Proverbs. And it is uh, Proverbs 14, verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, that one may turn away from the snares of death. In a multitude of people is the glory of a king, but without people a prince is ruined. This is really a reference, of course, to leadership, but it's reference to leadership also in the home. So for our Father's Day today, I want to open with a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the dads, for those that are hoping to be dads to be, and for those maybe who've had rough times with their own fathers, and for those who really honor their fathers for the leadership they provided in the home. We need, we need men of faith, Lord, within the family unit to guide the family in the spiritual admonition of the Lord. So please continue to bless all fathers in this congregation, in our land, around the world, that they may be leaders within their home, spiritual leaders, not just leaders of the household in general, to guide their family in the truth God's word gives them. In Jesus' name, amen. So my message today is not really on fathers. It's really about getting stuck sometimes in the middle, or maybe more specifically, what it is to live life in the middle. And let me elaborate. Sometimes this life in the middle is the mysterious middle. It's hard to understand what sometimes happens in our life of faith. And Jesus gives us a little understanding here when he shares this parable. Uh, and as you know, he said earlier in the text that this parable was really, these parables were really for people to have to ponder what he is saying about the kingdom of God. But to his disciples, he explained rather clearly what they meant. So Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a man who happens to scatter seed on the ground. And he, camps to, he couldn't sleep day or night. He wakes up and he sees that seed grow and then blossom as it develops into a crop that gets harvested. Well, I grew up on a farm, and usually when we planted seed, and we didn't have necessarily at the time, I was young at least, we didn't use a lot of pesticides or herbicides. So you always hoped those plants would make it. But your first hope was when you woke up, you'd look, has anything yet germinated, right? And when we would drive around, and I was driving up to Jetto yesterday, you know, the corn's already up, the soybeans are up, and crops are already breaking ground. But when you're at that interim time, that time where the seed is planted, you hope it actually germinates. Sometimes you get... Low rainfall, and it doesn't happen for a long time, or it's very spotty. Sometimes there's heavy rainfall, and the seed, as you know, is washed away. Sometimes weeds in the middle of the growing season tend to overtake the plant, and you just hope that there's going to be a harvest where you can actually bring out the combine, the sickle in the case of biblical times, and make a clean harvest. But God guides us through this middle. He guides us when that seed is planted, and he, through the Holy Spirit, tries to nurture us in our faith as sometimes we get hung up in the middle of our lives. So Jesus here is talking about the kingdom of God and how the Holy Spirit really is planting that seed and how sometimes when we have struggles in our life and sometimes our middle, by the way, is being redefined in the U.S. and we'll talk about that in a moment. But how in the middle of our lives or when we have struggles in our lives that that seed God takes very close care of. And it's a little like a, like a pilot light in an oven. It's usually on and even when our faith wavers, becomes what we might consider very small and struggling, the Holy Spirit can crank that pilot light up and become a flame again. So he talks about really that for a person that scatters a seed, in this case the Holy Spirit, and in the parable, the farmer, he has an initial hope that he, that seed will emerge, that will sprout. And he has an end hope that there's going to be great joy on the harvest. And that's like the kingdom of God. God knows that even as the Holy Spirit plants seeds, as we all get very concerned that the church is dying across the United States, that Christianity is on the wavering, well, God is in control through His Spirit. He knows there will be a bountiful harvest at the end. Now, we can be, in, however, in that path in the middle, and it can look rather bleak. It can be like a middle child. How many of you are middle children? You have your own unique psychological profile, as you know, as a middle child, right? So life in the middle can be unique, sometimes a struggle, sometimes very good. But it can be a path of uncertainty, and many of us have that uncertainty in the middle points of our lives. We used to call this the, the horseshoe or the, 
or the U-shape part of life. Where when you're young, you're super excited about your goals in life, you're all fired up, you're maybe going to school, maybe you've landed a new job and you're totally pumped, maybe you've met someone unique, a unique relationship is developing, and you're nothing but excited. Then you hit the end of that U when it begins to make the turn and you go, ooh, life with kids, if you have them, is not so easy. Those teenage years or those terrible twos, whichever age span you're at, can be sort of rough. And then you make the turn and you go up and you go toward the end of life. Sometimes the end of life can be very happy. You have increased maturity. Um, anger comes maybe less readily to you. You have developed a degree of wisdom, hopefully, by the end of your life. And you have a, also a degree of happiness and a maturity maybe in your spiritual setting. But it's that middle of life which can become a struggle. This U-shape has been borne out in some pictorials. I couldn't capture the whole thing on here, but you get it on the left-hand side, a young couple. On the bottom, you can see the frowns beginning to show, you know, as you struggle with, with your children sometimes, or with your, even your life in general, the dreaded midlife crises that we sometimes have as adults, and sometimes in particular men seem to be falling into that. And then the end of life, where you're happy, you're free, maybe you're retired, and life is theoretically on the upswing. But today, that's really turned around. It's more like our U-shape that we've talked about historically is more like this, right? That sort of the curves, those bends in our life can happen rather early on in life. In fact, in the U.S., we have what's called the Exvangelicals. And it's a group of millennials and Gen X's. If you remember what they are, I'll show you if you don't. And they are exiting the church because of tradition, because of sometimes what is taught in the, uh, in the colleges and the universities, where really we, I was doing, looking at some research yesterday, uh, last night actually, about the percent of atheists within colleges and universities across the United States. It was a little bit of a dated study back in 2007, but it had a much higher percentage of atheism in the professors of our universities than is present in the, in the population as a whole. And there's a little bit of a thought that that cascades a little bit to the sentiments of those of our children that we move on to schools and university education. And we're seeing a real exit from the traditional church for a lot of reasons. The influence of the culture and cultural norms, of course, are very strong. But it's really not in men, it's in young women who are leaving. Young women are really being turned off by the tradition of the church. And we pray that, that God, with his Holy Spirit, will continue to guide them as they get shaped a little bit by the culture today, a little bit of a shunning of tradition, and they get brought back into the fold of the church. And that's what we hope for. But they're in the middle. So when you look at a demographic profile, I tried to put a rectangle over the Gen X's in case you don't remember who they are. They're on the very high end, they'd be about 58 years old. And if you go to the, uh, or the millennials, 58, the Gen X's would be probably on the low end, 28. So you have a span of about low 20s, up, or mid 20s to upper 20s, all the way up to 58, which sounds rather old doesn't seem young. But the younger sector within that grouping of Gen X's and Millennials are leaving the church in high percentages. And they're in the middle of the demographic population of the United States. Life in the middle can sometimes get rough. And there also is that cultural norm that we all hit, which is, I like something certain in life. I like to have a solid knowledge of what's going to happen. And sometimes faith, of course, is a belief that there is hope for the future, that there's going to be a joyful end, but it isn't sometimes as solid as scientific knowledge. And that desire for knowledge that we have in our culture is a struggle when we try to fit it together with our beliefs at times. It's this need to have things sort of guaranteed in life, to know that it's certain, that it's very probable it's going to happen, versus it's unlikely. So faith, of course, is not based on sight, as Apostle Paul says. And when you're a young woman standing in the middle, of life, as a millennial or Gen Xer, you're faced with the two poles. You're right sort of in the middle of the demographic segment. And yet the Holy Spirit, God says, will continue to work in all of us, whether you're male or female. And this is, of course, from Isaiah, where a bruised reed will never be broken. I think you get the idea of it. A bent reed, God can still put life into a bent reed in any of us, in any of those that you know that may have lost someone that you love, someone in your family unit, I mean, we all have them, right? That is maybe strayed away from the faith. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to take that 
bruised reed, straighten it back up, put life into it, and regenerate the faith. And God says that he will do that. And just the mustard seed of faith can bloom into a great tree, as you know. And he also says here in Isaiah the prophet that a smoldering wick will not be snuffed out. Smoldering wick, of course, is where that flame, that pilot light, looks like it's not even hanging in there. Well, God says that smoldering wick will relight up. Faith in those that you love. Faith that has been planted, in particular, in those that have been baptized. The Holy Spirit will work his work. We look at somebody that had sort of a mysterious middle in his life, it would be Nicodemus within the Bible. Remember, he was a member of the Supreme Court of the Jews called the Sanhedrin. It's where they got together and they sort of invoked Jewish law on the people. They tried to make the proper rulings for what you should and should do on a Sabbath and all the other days of the week and how you obeyed the Ten Commandments. Well, he was a member of that Sanhedrin that was really against Christ, and yet he heard about Christ and he wondered, and the Holy Spirit was working in him. He got together with others, as you know, in The Chosen. He was talking with Mary Magdalene. Whether he did or not, we don't know. But he certainly investigated who is this Jesus that purports to be the Son of God. And so, because he was a member of the ruling body, he sought to see Jesus at night, where he might not be seen by others and not be ridiculed for the fact that he had a high degree of curiosity. And Christ, of course, shared with him. And the Holy Spirit worked in Nicodemus. And by the end of the journey of Christ's journey on this earth, Nicodemus brought 70 pounds of myrrh and, and particular, um, what do I say, spices to Christ's grave to anoint Jesus. He, with Joseph of Arimathea, who bought the tomb, actually took Jesus' body and helped, embal- helped prepare the body for burial. Nicodemus felt the work of the Holy Spirit when he was in the middle of his life journey, where he felt a little bit stuck as a member of the Sanhedrin. And he was willing to take ridicule, we believe, on behalf of Christ, even as he struggled with the fact that he buried the Son of God. And yet he had great joy, as all of us have, when Christ rose from the dead. Christ himself was stuck in the middle, was he not? He was stuck in the middle between two sinners, two thieves, that were being crucified with him. He was stuck in the middle between earth and heaven when he was on this particular planet in his journey. When he went into Passion Week in Jerusalem, he was stuck in the middle between a joyous entry into the city and a predicted brutal death. But yet he was victorious. And those that were around him, that saw him die, were stuck in the middle those days, weren't they? Struggling with their own faith. Was he really God? Did God actually really die? When he talked about rising, could that possibly even come true? The disciples, they were stuck in the middle. They wondered, boy, I thought we were following this Christ. I thought he was going to be something like that. And maybe he talked to us a little bit about this death and resurrection. Never really sunk into my brain. And they were stuck in the middle in the upper room. But Paul makes it so very clear that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And the Holy Spirit will not snuff that, let that wick get snuffed out. That fire will again bloom. You are a new creation. So there is hope when seed is planted in you, faith. And there is joy, joy of the resurrection that we all can share in. And for those within our families and those within our friends that are maybe moving slightly away from the faith in a fear of tradition, in a fear of maybe what God's Word said, well, God will bring them back. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's that mustard seed faith that turns into this beautiful plant that holds all the beautiful birds of creation. That's what God has in store. A plant that has a seed so small, yet it can blossom and take over a garden. That's what life in the middle can turn out to be. So if you're struggling, know that God will get you through that. If you're hurting, know that God will relieve your pain. And if you have someone that's struggling in faith or you are, know that the Holy Spirit's going to turn up that pilot light and it's going to become a strong flame. In Jesus' name, amen.